Well, if you want to turn in your Bibles, we are going to finish Second Peter. We, um, if those of you that keep track, which I'm sure none of you do, because um, no one is wired that way to actually keep track. Uh, I don't, but I had to look and see, and we started First Peter on November 13th was the first Sunday that we opened our Bibles to First Peter, and so if you're counting, it's been seven months, seven months we have been in First and Second Peter, seven months we have opened our hearts to five chapters, or eight chapters um, total in First and Second Peter of what God would do to reveal to us what he has to say to us about a very certain topic and the the theme or the topic or the focus of first and second peter was understanding um, and embracing our culture what does it mean to embrace and understand our culture so that we can engage culture with the power of the gospel what does it mean to understand this is who God created me to be. This is the community that God has put me in. This is the desires of my heart that are starting to get focused in on the reality of the gospel. And here is how I can really, truly, absolutely begin to serve with that in mind. So as you begin to think about kind of bringing a close um, to this time and this season, we're going to spend um, a couple more weeks just reflecting because we don't like to just move on at Second Mile. We like to pause and to take time to hear what has been processed, what has been learned, what has God been doing in the hearts of his people. But as we kind of close out at least the official um, section this evening, I want you to think through the title of this evening, which is this. Internal transformation, external influence. As you have engaged in the subject matter of Peter's letters, as you have thought through the character of Peter, as you have thought about his transformation, how Jesus, when Peter walked with Jesus, how Jesus very specifically and very directly and very intimately directed Peter's life to be transformed into his likeness and his mission and his purposes? And then what kind of external influence did Peter have? On you, I will build my church. What does it look like to think about Peter in that grandeur, in that kind of big stuff? And yet we sit here in 2013 in Tucson, Arizona, and we read the letters of this great apostle, and the question is, well, what about me? How do I understand and see and process the reality of transformation? Are you being transformed into the likeness of Jesus? Has this journey over the last seven months actually made a difference in your life? Are you different today than you were a month ago or three months ago or seven months ago? And as God is transforming your life, then what's the point? Is it so that you're happier? Is it so that you're more content? Is it so fill in the blank, whatever you want to put in there? Or is it possible that with along many, many, many good things when it comes to transformation, what God is trying to do in your life and in your heart is actually make a difference externally as you influence the people around you? That is at the very heart of Peter's letters. And that's where we're going to continue to process and move as we finish out the text um, in chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 11. I'll read in verse 11. There's a little bit of overlap from last week, and then we'll get in through the rest of the chapter. So starting in verse 11 of 2 Peter chapter 3, this is what we find Peter saying. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish 
and at peace and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Verse 11 basically very quickly sums up what we had read last week in verses 8 through 10. And it says, so because of this reality, because of God's character, because of his patience, because of his slowness in what we may describe as slowness, he's being patient with us so that people have time to understand him and understand his character and understand where he's moving us towards his righteousness. And then the reality of phenomenal catastrophe at the end of the world as God destroys the old, that the old earth and the old heavens will pass and then God will create something new. And so we read about that and we thought about that and we questioned those things last week. And so this week, verse 11 says, so because of those realities that we spoke of, live a new quality of life. Because you know of the truth of the future, the truth of God's patience, the truth of him preparing a people for himself to speak the, the truth of the gospel to their communities, because you know that, then live a different sort of life. Live a transformed life. Live a life that influences other people. And so when we read verse 11, it really reminds us reminds us of earlier in Peter's letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, which says this, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. You guys have to understand as you continue to read through and process the letters of Peter that a huge theme, I mean giant theme of Peter is holiness. A giant theme of Peter is obedience. A giant theme of what God wants to manifest in you, what he wants to come out of your lives is a pursuit of righteousness, not because the law says so, but because you are so deeply changed by Jesus that you cannot help but live differently. To be holy as the one who called you is holy. Verse 11 says, so these are the sort of people that you ought to be. Be holy people. Be godly people. And then verse 12 says, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. There's the old will be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Again, we live to please God because we are looking forward we're looking forward to the future. We're looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. We're looking forward to the promise of, promises of God actually becoming a reality. Our prayers and our righteousness, I don't know if you have clued into this, can actually quicken his return. There's a passage in Matthew that says, the nations will be reached with the message of the gospel and then the end will come. What does it look like for us to quicken the return of Christ? Is your prayer life centered on the reality of saying, Jesus, I want you to come. I want you to come now. I want the newness to be here now. I want you to bring restoration to this broken world Jesus, please come. And is your lifestyle reflective of that quickening of the return of Christ? Do your prayers move you to pray for the return of Jesus? Then verse 13 again begins to describe what's going to happen. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens 
and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Revelation 16 20 says, And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. You can also continue to read in Revelation chapter 21. It's actually the whole chapter of 21 and then into chapter 22, verse 5. And I would encourage you to read all of chapter 21. I'm just going to close it in chapter 22, the first five verses. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the rivers, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. There is a reality that the new heaven and the new earth will come with Jesus' return. Scott and Janice, if you don't know Scott and Janice Appleman, they're one of the original couples that moved here with us to Tucson to start Second Mile. And uh, Scott's a teacher, and Scott's a word guy, and Scott and Janice both enjoy reading to their children. If you know anything about Ellie and Lucy, um, you know that they are extremely verbal in how they process the world, and they're extremely verbal in how they process the world because Janice is extremely verbal in how she processes the world, and Scott is extremely verbal in terms of how he understands the world and takes in the world. And so Scott was actually reading the storybook Bible to Ellie. And the storybook Bible is the Bible that we gave last week to all the families that dedicated their children. And so he was reading through the story in whatever section he was in, I don't know exactly what he was reading, but he was reading about the new heavens and the new earth. And so as he was reading this with Ellie, they had this conversation about what is the new heavens and what are the new earth and what's going to happen there and how is that going to be? And as Scott began to decide and tell her, well, this is when Jesus is going to return and this is how he's going to establish these things, Ellie took it in. Well, I don't know how much time passed. My assumption is maybe the next day, Janice is coming down the stairs of their home. They have a two-story house, and Janice is coming down the stairs, and Ellie is awaiting Janice at the bottom of the stairs. And as Janice comes down, it's kind of that, you know, what you've been doing kind of moment that you have with your children. And Ellie jumps up and says, I've been praying, Mom. And Janice says, well, Ellie, what have you been praying for? And she said, I've been praying that when God brings the new heavens and the new earth, that, that he will make fairies real. <laughs> and he's going to do it. <laughs> and Janice said, okay, <laughs> that's great, right? What was important to Ellie? Fairies. What did she know that she needed to pray for? God, they may not exist now, but oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. When you start things from scratch again, make fairies real. Now, as you think about her innocent, wonderful, joyful, amazing prayer, how do you reflect on the new heavens and the new earth? What are your anticipations? What are your joys? What are your thoughts leaning towards as you think about a life of holiness, as you think about a life of godliness, as you think about that, yes, God is going to destroy the sun. That's kind of crazy. And yet there will be no need for the sun because the Savior of the world will be shining brightly for all of eternity. Have you thought about that glorious manifestation of the greatness of our God? That is what Peter is trying to get us to understand. So the first batch of questions as we look through verses 11 through 13 and then continue on is this. Do you live in the reality that Jesus is returning? How are you actively engaging in the mission of God to expedite his return. 
Who are those in your sphere of influence that we've used these words over and over again? And these are questions that are actually repeated from last week, so you may already have them written down. Who are those in your sphere of influence that need your compassion, your urgency, and your anticipation? Verse 7, excuse me, verse 14 moves on and it says, therefore, and you guys now know your condition to know that when we see that word, it's meant to conclude the previous thoughts, to conclude, hey, this is what we just heard. So now what do we do with what we just heard? And so here in verse 14, Peter says, here it comes. This is what we do with the reality of all the verses that we have just talked about in the previous section. Beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him. Here comes this major theme again. Without spot or blemish and at peace. Verse 14 begins to summarize this amazing reality of the new heavens and the new earth and the return of Jesus. And it says the realization of God's righteousness and the reality of Jesus' return does what? It encourages or becomes the basis towards us for ethical exhortation. What does that mean? It means Jesus is returning. It means the new heavens and the new earth are coming. And so you now have motivation to be holy. That's what it means. Do you live a holy life and do you see the return of Christ as motivation for that sort of holy living? Some obvious, simple questions surrounding the truth of verse 14 is this. What encourages you towards holiness? Do you think about holiness? Do you think about your own lifestyle? Do you think about the different areas of your life that need to be tweaked? Not tweaked because you're searching for behavior modification, but tweaked because you are absolutely searching for this internal transformation that can only come because of the presence of Jesus in your life. What is your pursuit of holiness? How do you intake the Word of God? How do you meditate on the Word of God? How do you memorize the Word of God? How do you listen to the Word of God? How do you talk to other people about the Word of God? And as you do those things, how is the Word of God changing you towards holiness, towards righteousness, towards obedience? What is your motivation for purity? We have all sorts of motivations. We have all sorts of reasons of why we do the things we do, why we have conversations the way we have conversations, why we act the way we act at work, why we work out the way we work out or don't work out the way we don't work out or eat what we eat or don't eat what we don't eat. We have motivations. You can think of multiple, many layers of motivations of why you live your life the way you live your life. And some of those motivations cause you to feel guilty and some of those motivations cause you to feel lackadaisical and some of those motivations get you super excited because you want to jump up and down and just talk about whatever God's doing in your life. But what is your motivation for purity? Do you have one? What should it be? And how do you find the answers to those questions? Does eternity influence your present decisions? I mean, how much do you think about eternity? How much do you think about the future? Now, some of you say, well, Chad, the Bible says that we shouldn't think about tomorrow for today has enough trouble on its own. You're right. The Bible does say that. But... When we're thinking about the imminent return of Christ, it becomes a motivation for how we deal with the troubles of the day. So are you thinking about the future? Not so that it consumes you, but so that it motivates you for the present. What does it look like to truly be motivated by the purity and the quality of relationship that we might have with Jesus? Verse 14 he uses the word again, beloved, and then he uses action works, words, activating words, be diligent, or your Bible may say, make every effort. 
Be diligent. Make every effort. This brings back to our attention more passages that came from Peter's letter before. Chapter 1, verse 5 of 2 Peter says this, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Make every effort and virtue with knowledge. And then verse 10 in chapter 1 says, Therefore, brothers, same word, brothers, brethren, beloved, be all the more diligent. Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. You want joy. You want the absence of guilt in your life. You want purpose. You want the continued understanding of redemption. You want to see God's activity surrounding your life and surrounding the lives of the people around you, then what Peter says to us is to be diligent and to make every effort. You guys know it's actually gonna be two years really soon that I kind of started a new health journey and it started with insanity and there's a lot more people out there now that are doing insanity and we're all insane nights now and it's a lot of fun and I've had different levels of when am I going to do it and when am I not going to do it and you know all those kinds of things and so I have wanted to get back into running a little bit more too so I've been trying to do that and for a while just because I am very spontaneous like my personality is sponta spontaneity to the nth degree um, and so it's very hard for me to have a plan. That's why when I was just doing month one and month two of Insanity, there was no questions, there was no options. You just do it and you get through it and you sweat and you die and you feel good afterwards. At least that's the theory. So I had done Insanity a couple different times and I wanted to do something new and do something different. And so I'm like, I want to run and I want to do Insanity, but I can't figure out how to do it and it's not working out. And I was having a conversation with Phil actually and he just looked at me in this duh sort of tone of voice and it really, it was good. He was loving me. And he said, Chad, just run one day and do Insanity the next day. Now all of you are looking at me like, well, yeah, duh. That's a great idea. <laughs> I'm just going to run one day and do Insanity the next day. And I'm not trying to finish Insanity in two months, which that's what I was trying to figure out. How can I run and still stay on the same program? And I'm like, this is just a lifestyle. This is just a movement to be what I need to be. All right. So I am now in week five, I think, of me running Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays and doing Insanity Tuesday. Thursday and Saturdays. I even had a class in San Francisco and I still had a perfect week and I was super excited and I was like, yes, I did it. And that was week three. And so I've had week four and then this last week was week five. And let's just say week five's been a little harder to be consistent. Number one, it is 100 degrees by nine o'clock and I don't like to get up super early before I have to go do stuff. And so that's a demotivator. And then usually I have stuff to do in the evening. And so trying to wait to run by 7.30, that's also a demotivator. And so let's just say that over time, what's the point of the story? Over time, it's difficult to stay consistent. No matter your plan, no matter the joy that you get out of it, no matter the difference that it makes in your body or how you feel or the way people talk about your life, in this little microcosm of my life that's known as my personal health journey, there's lots of benefits, there's lots of motivations, there's lots of exterior things, and yet still in week five, after almost two years of trying to make this an absolute part of my life, I still struggle with consistency. So what does this have to say about purity? What does this have to say about righteousness? What does this have to say about waking up in the morning and remembering that Jesus is returning? You may have been a believer, a follower of Jesus, a child of God for 15 years. And every year you look back and say, wow, God, you have been here and yet you're getting weary as well. And so as you reflect on the words of Peter, you may say, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. He is patient. What does it mean to be patient? You may have been a follower of Jesus or a believer or someone who wants to begin to live their lives differently because of the presence of Jesus in your life and it may have only been six months. 
It may have been only a couple of years and you have sensed that the excitement that was once there has waned a little because life has just gotten full. Life has gotten busy. Life has gotten distracting. And so what does it look like for you to still say purity and holiness and making every effort and diligence is good? And I will continue to pursue the beauty of that relationship with Jesus because Jesus is absolutely worth it. Peter uses two different words here to kind of describe this diligence. And he says spotless and blameless. He used two opposite words earlier that says they are nothing but blots and blemishes. And so Peter is bringing some conclusion into these images that he's bringing into the text. He's saying you are spotless. You are blameless. If you are a child of God, it is a motivator for holiness. The already, not yet. You're already cleansed. You're already white as snow. You're already bought with the blood of Christ that he paid your penalty for death on the cross. If you are his child, then you are white as snow. And yet you still aren't experiencing the fullness of God because the end of time has not yet come. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15 says this, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Is that not a description of internal transformation, external influence? Read that again. That you may be blameless, same word, and innocent children of God, without blemishes, same word, in the midst of what? What has Peter described about our culture? What has Peter described about false teaching? So that when you live your lives in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, you will shine as lights in the world. What motivation, what glorious declaration that says we can do this. We have the ability to live our lives in such a way that it shows, it reflects, it gives opportunity for people to see the glorious reality of a risen Savior who's coming again. Jude chapter 1 verse 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. What did Peter say in his earlier words? I, the Jesus, speaking of Jesus, he's saying Jesus has come. He has given you everything necessary for life and godliness. Do you live that way? When you reflect on the seven months of us being in Peter's letters, do you have a confidence that you can overcome sin, that you can overcome those certain barriers in your life that have prevented you from really going to the next step with your relationship with God? That's the confidence. That's the joy. That's the motivation. So the questions from those verses are this. What are the thoughts and emotions you have concerning a status of blamelessness before God. You should have thoughts. You should have emotions. When God says to you, because of my son, when Jesus says to you, because of my life and my death and my resurrection, when the Holy Spirit says to you, because of my presence in the current world, you, if you are my child, you are blameless. That should evoke something in you. What does it evoke? Have you fully embraced your inheritance as God's adopted child? I said last week when we did the child dedication that literally I could have just sat there and had a good cry because it was just... It just filled my heart in ways that I can not explain. When I looked at each family and I thought about each of those stories that was represented through each of those families, when I see the hurt that those families have experienced, when I see the joys that those families have experienced, when I see 
the reality of coming up here and partnering together with a whole community of people and saying, we want to dedicate our children to the glory of God. We want to be a witness in their lives to say, Jesus is worth it. Our family is worth pursuing Jesus because Jesus is worth it. When I think about the stories of the children's lives that have already happened and have yet to happen, the theme of adoption is so real in our church. It's real in my family. It's real in the Weatherford's family. It's real in the LaPose family. It's real in the Kelly's family. It's real in multiple families as God continues to put the heart of his people in tandem with his heart. And yet, earthly adoption, as great and as wonderful and as amazing and as absolutely beautiful as it is, is only a glimmer of what Christ has done for us in creating a way for you and for I to be adopted into the family of God. Do you believe that? Do you know what it means to be the adopted child of the king of the universe? Do you feel the joy? Do you feel the security? Do you feel the patience of a parent that wants you to live a good and holy and righteous life? Do you feel the excitement of what it means to be part of that kind of family? We, as God's children, should consider his patience as an opportunity for repentance. Even if you're his son or his daughter, and you have found yourself in the revolving door of a trap of sin, that even though you know that God has set you free, that you have experienced redemption, that trap has you. It is a snare. It is grabbing hold and drawing blood, and you have weeks of success, and you have weeks of defeat. Is it possible that as you read through this, you see that the patience of Jesus returning is actually for you to experience a season of your life where that sin is not snaring you, where you're not bleeding out because of the guilt of that sin? Living guilt-free and sin-free especially in things that have devastated you or overcome you in seasons of your life, it's a pretty remarkable feeling. And could it be that Jesus is just waiting for you to experience his patience that will lead you towards repentance? Because you are waiting for God to destroy the present world and to form a new one, you should do two things. Number one, these will not surprise you. It's kind of review Peter reviews really the last few verses of this chapter, all the things that he's talked about up to this point. Number one, be diligent to live godly lives so that you will receive your eternal reward. A theme throughout all of Peter, first and second Peter. And the second one, consider the Lord's patience or his apparent delay in coming as an opportunity for salvation. We must have compassion. We must grow in urgency. We must anticipate the second coming of Christ so that we can engage in a crooked generation. And as we engage in that crooked generation, we can offer hope. And the hope that we have to offer is the love of being adopted into the family of God. Verses 15 and 16. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom, wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Verses 15 and 16 in some ways seem a little disconnected, and yet we need to learn about why does Peter bring up Paul? 
Well, there's reason that Peter brings up Paul. Paul's words or his letters were being twisted to justify the actions of the false teachers. So if you know the controversy surrounding the words of Paul, if you know that as Paul spoke about grace, as Paul spoke about not by our works, but by grace that God has given us, he would say, so should we sin? No, should we just keep on sinning so that grace will continue to cover us? And people heard that, heard what Paul said and ran with it, but they didn't hear how Paul finished it. He says, by no means should we do that. And yet the twisted, the false teaching, the culture that wanted to hear, I can live whatever lifestyle I want to live. I don't have to be trapped by the law. The grace of God will cover me. That is false. That is not what Paul was teaching. And so Peter brings this up because of the theme of a crooked generation, because of the theme of false teaching. What we also learn from verse 15 and 16 is this. Many of Paul's letters had already started to be read and distributed throughout the region. It's pretty exciting when you begin to think about that these apostles that were writing the inspirational truths of God that would eventually become canonized as the word of God, that they were already starting to be distributed and people were already listening and reading the words that God would use for the revelation of his character. The content was becoming more and more known, especially by Peter. And as you think through this stuff, there was a misinterpretation of Scripture or of Paul's letters to justify their immorality. And yet, despite maybe Peter and Paul's rocky start in some of their relationship, as they had experienced disagreement and growing pains, which we're going to look at just a second, Peter and Paul were a united front for the cause of Christ. What does Peter say about Paul in verses 15 and 16? He calls him, yet again, beloved brother, which means there's a partnership and an equality in their mission. And the second thing he says about Paul is this. He already, Peter, already calls Paul's writing scripture. And the same word that Peter uses to describe Paul's writings as scripture is the same word that is given to give the Old Testament equal authority to Paul's writings. So already before the first generation of those who walked with Jesus had left this earth, they're already declaring the inerrancy, the revelation of God's character in the writings of Paul. Tremendous. Tremendous insight in two little verses that seem kind of random in the last letter of Peter, and yet it gives us cool insight. I want to very quickly read this because guess what? Those of us who love Jesus and want to follow Jesus and have a mission for Jesus, sometimes we don't get along. Galatians chapter 2. If you want to turn there with me, you can. Galatians chapter 2 describes a situation between Peter and Paul starting in verse 11. Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood conde condemned. That's Cephas meaning Peter. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, to Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? What is this whole point? The whole point is Paul rebukes Peter in public. Paul says, you're so worried about pleasing people. Notice what had happened to Peter when Jesus was crucified. He was worried about what other people thought. And Jesus told him, you're going to deny me because you're interested in pleasing man over pleasing me. And Jesus had even restored him. And yet it was still something that Peter suffered from. I don't want to get called out. I don't want to seem this way or that way. People are going to look badly upon me. And and Paul shows up and, and then sees Barnabas even influenced by Peter's activities. And Paul says to Peter, dude, you've got to cut it out. There's a rebuke. There's love. 
And yet, even though it seems like they may be at odds with each other in certain areas of their life, when Peter finishes his letter at the end of his life, what does he say about Paul? Beloved brother, whose letters are equal to the authority of the Old Testament, God is good. And our relationship is restored. Maybe you've been at odds with people in this room. Maybe you've been at odds with other people who know Jesus, who love Jesus, and maybe those odds are not the type of odds that you find yourself in six months to say, hey, we're going to throw a party and everything's going to be 100% lovely. But at the same time, what can we learn from Peter and Paul's relationship when it comes to restoring the beauty of God's mission interpersonally? Verse 17, back to 2 Peter chapter 3. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. What is verse 17 saying to us? Peter knows that assurance becomes a reality by heeding warnings. We get confidence in certain areas by listening to the people around us give us caution, give us encouragement, give us pointers and how do we increase or become better at what God is asking us to do. Those who are on their God, guard will not fall from their, full, from their secure position. While those who are careless are apt to slip away because they ignored the warning signals. If we are to truly understand verse 17, then what we understand about verse 17 is that those who finally do turn aside and fall away from the truth of the gospel revealed that they were never really part of the people of God. If you look at Judas as an example, who would have known the character of Jesus more than 98% of the population? One of the 12, one of Jesus' closest people. And yet in the middle of his depth of an understanding of who Jesus is, he never engaged in embracing the fullness of Christ in his life. So close. Yet he didn't, war he didn't heed the warnings of those around him. He saw greed and he saw opportunity as something above what Jesus could offer him. And ultimately it cost him not just his earthly life, but his eternal life. As you think about your life, maybe you have been exposed to church and God and Jesus and Christian music and every, you, you only shop at Hobby Lobby, but do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And are you heed, heeding the warnings? Because if your life is not different, I question if you know Jesus. Jesus says to us, we will know my followers by their fruit. Are you bearing fruit? Are you growing in a knowledge and an understanding of the greatness of Christ in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19 says, For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. What does that mean? There's a warning. There's going to be people who are off just a little bit among you because it helps you refine your faith. Who or how are you being refined by? Do you notice those little things that they just don't seem quite right? And how does it affect your faith? How does it affect your conversations? Are you growing in an understanding of Jesus' presence in your life? 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, another warning. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. There are some people probably in this room that would shock us in the reality of they have kept Jesus just slightly away from the depths of their heart. Because it would actually mean that they become honest with themselves 
and honest with the people around them to make a difference in how they will actually have internal transformation. If you are there, what is God going to have to do to you to get you serious about his son? To get serious about living a holy and righteous and Jesus following all encompassing life. Verse 18, I always feel like when I'm about to read the last verse of a book or a series that we should just, I don't know, throw a big giant party, confetti should drop from the roof, trumpets should sound in your head, bull riding should take place or something, I don't know. <laughs> verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, usually we take a lot of time putting together what are the last words going to be on the page. When you're writing a letter, when you're finishing a paper, when you're trying to get that blog just right, you want the last words, you want the last sentence to just really be a zinger. You want it to really dive deeply into what's going on, an email. You know, how many of you think all the time, I can't just say sincerely, I have to say something creative, I have to say something, in, you know, it shows my personality or, you know, we think about those last little words. My guess is Peter thought about his last little words. And in verse 18 of his second letter, as he closes, he simply says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. If you turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we read of this grace. Simeon, Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. What did he end the letter with? Grow with. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Grace. Verses one through four describe grace. It describes the mission of Jesus. It describes the cross. It describes the resurrection. It describes our ability as adopted children of God to enjoy the pleasures of God. Do you experience this sort of grace? And then Peter says, not only grow in grace, but grow in knowledge. And guess what knowledge is? Well, Peter already told us in verses five through eight of 2 Peter chapter one. So it just continues. The thoughts just keep going. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and with virtue. Here it comes. Knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and what we're growing and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Your heart should be pumping. Your veins should be bulging. Your brain should be exploding in the beauty of being God's child. In the beauty of growing in what? Grace. In growing in what? Knowledge. Where is knowledge in the Christian life? Action. It doesn't just swim around in your head. Where's the warning of false teaching and the warning of culture? The warning is you are stuck. You are allowing life to stick you in the mud and you're not letting Jesus pull you out. 
Don't be caught left without salvation. Allow the patience of God, the kindness of God, the beauty of God, the glory of God, the manifestation of Jesus to bring you to a point of repentance. That's the point of Peter. Change. Be changed. Internal transformation. So that then the people externally can understand and hear and know and respond to your influence. As we close this great letter, ask these questions. Take the time to get alone with God and ponder how you have grown in grace and knowledge. If you haven't changed, why? What sin or rebellion or issue are you ignoring that is preventing you from living authentically before a great and sovereign God? Do you value the glory of Jesus? As the worship team comes up and starts to get into place with music, I'm going to ask Brad to keep that slide on the screen. As they start to play that slide to still be on the screen for you to ponder these questions, to get a head start, you're not going to answer these questions fully tonight. You're probably not going to answer these questions fully in the next week. But my prayer is that you will start. And that my hope is that we as a people will so understand what it means to live holy and pure and righteous lives that we will be reminded of God's grace and we will be, we will be reminded of his knowledge and we will be different. And as we are different, then we will begin to influence the culture in which God has set us to make a difference.